Hello and welcome to um, this seminar entitled Temporal Uncertainties, Humanities in the Time of Corona, um, which is presented as a Dorothea Green lecture series in the Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs. Also co-sponsored the discussion today by the Wolfsonian Public Humanities Lab, the Humanities Edge Program, the Department of Religious Studies, and the Department of History. I'm Rebecca Friedman, Associate Professor of History and the Director of the Emerging Preeminent Program, the Wolfsonian Public Humanities Lab. So welcome everybody to this panel and to our discussion today. And a special thanks to Pedro Bota, whose idea this was. So I just want to shout out to Pedro for the idea. Um, today I have the great honor to introduce three of my brilliant, which is not an overstatement, um, colleagues, each of whom has been central to building the public humanities program and each of whom has been so incredibly thoughtful during this time of global pandemic in a number of ways. Um, I'm going to introduce each of them now and then I'll share my own very brief thoughts and then turn it over to them one by one. First we have Julio Capo, Dr. Julio Capo, who is the Deputy Director of the uh, Wolfsonian Public Humanities Lab and also an Associate Professor in History. We have Ana Menendez, the director of FIU's Humanities Edge Program, and also an incoming um, associate professor in English slash creative writing and the Wolfsonian Public Humanities Lab. And we have Whitney Bauman, associate professor in the Department of Religious Studies at FIU. Okay, those are my introductions. Now, if you allow it, I'll just say a few words about the topic myself. So time. That's what we're talking about today, time. The accordion nature of time. We're gonna be contextualizing meanings of time. These are topics I've been thinking about and reading about for well over a decade at this point. At first, the very notion that time itself opens up, that there are many ways of knowing and experiencing time, eschewing its assumptive objective power was eye-opening for me something that seems so stable and so locked in. Some theorists write about the difference between private time and public time. One tied to objective measures like the ticking of a clock or Greenwich Mean Time, and others think about private time, which itself is more amorphous, less predictable, more subject to the whims of the moment, well, nothing, of course, is ever quite that dichotomous, especially something as slippery as temporality. Nothing is that cut and dry, especially time. It does give, give us a kind of roadmap to think through these questions today in the time of corona. In the first week or so of this corona pandemic and the corona confinement, the Public Humanities Lab began to collect stories uh, from among members of our communities, both far and wide. We wanted to create a, at the risk of overstating, a kind of archive of empathy of these times, um, uh, of images, of words, of sounds, all of it. And the project itself is ongoing, so I, ever, I hope whoever listens to this will go and look at our website and contribute. The first theme that we included was, in fact, time. Um, so I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna just read from my own reactions then, only because it was from week one. It was the very first few days of this pandemic and our confinement. Perceptions of time shift profoundly across history and geography. How long is a second? A day, how long have I been in my sweatpants or not left the house? My 18 year old, actually now 19 since time's passed, who was supposed to be flying back to college today is playing a game with himself to see how long he can stay indoors, creating stations for sitting inside in order to demarcate the bits of the day. There were always meals, breakfast, lunch, dinner, but now we have sitting stations, chair, couch, stool, bed, tick tock, tick tock. I'm always aware of time, its movements, its deception, and its friendlier guises. Once one turns 50 and beyond, all bets are off, and one wishes for time to simply slow the hell down. Not now not in the age of corona. How many weeks until quarantine's over, test results in, I can return to normal life? How many hours until it's tomorrow? 
Inside each day, there resides a whole universe, a whole range of feelings and contemplations and cogitations, from joy to unity to grief at the Italian bodies on social media to fury at the lack of federal leadership in this country, fear, grief at death, poverty, and the unknown. The bed that was once a refuge is now a trap. What will a minute feel like when it's all over? Time has slowed down in many ways. I might have wished for it just a week ago. Has it really only been a week? So on that note, the reflections from week one, I'm going to turn it over to, first of all, um, the first of my excellent colleagues to hear their reflections on temporal uncertainties in these times in past, present, and future. And first up is Dr. Koppel. Julio. Hi. Thank, Thank you. you for Thanks, Rebecca. And I just want to echo Rebecca's thanks and, and gratitude and, um, and on, what, what a great honor it is to be here with these three people who, um, I hope that it comes across in my comments, who have influenced me a lot because uh, all three of you teach me and teach us so much. Uh, as I was thinking about uh, what I wanted to contribute to our conversation today, I kept coming back to two things in particular, uh, zombies and ghosts. Um, and maybe it's a, a reflection of the difficult and perhaps macabre times that we are living in, but uh, you know, we are talking about the global pandemic relating to the novel coronavirus, uh, but we are also seeing, of course, more of the anti-Black violence of the state and the pandemic of racism in the United States and beyond. Uh, so following the murder of, of George Floyd by Minneapolis police and so many, much, you know, many more such cases of state-induced violence and death, targeting black people, it's critical to discuss these two side by side as integrated conversations. So surely anti-black violence is not new to this time of corona, um, but it exacerbates conditions and puts black people at greater risk for numerous things. As Ibram Kendi's powerful piece in the Atlantic and so many others written by, by a number of public intellectuals have shown us, coronavirus is among other things, exposing our racial divides. Uh, while data sets are not complete or even always reliable, um, that is, they're checkered, uh, the numbers are probably pretty conservative. At the very least, we know um, that the death rates attributed to coronavirus are higher for Black Americans, Latinx Americans, and among some Indigenous communities. So I was thinking, I, I look back to Kennedy's article and he said, sometimes racial data tell us something we don't know, but other times we need racial data to confirm something we already seem to know. So of course the conversations about time and coronavirus are also deeply integrated and connected to experiences of systemic racism. How our sense of time has changed as a result of coronavirus and its debilitating effects are also deeply connected to housing issues, to climate crises, employment and labor, segregation, health inequities, mass incarceration, and the broader issue, of course, of anti-Blackness and state violence in the United States. So no doubt people's time of sense has changed as a result of coronavirus, but for, for many people, Black and Brown people disproportionately, their lives have changed largely through death and greater fear death, but the fear was already there. They represent a disproportionate number of people deemed essential workers during this outbreak, for instance, for many, quarantine or isolation was a luxury they could not afford should they want to minimize their, their chances of being without even a small sense of financial security and so much more beyond that. So I come back to these ideas of zombies and ghosts somehow. When FIU asked us to do this talk, I had just published a piece uh, about the pandemic in uh, relationship to the metaphors in the Washington Post made by History Section, which is the space uh, for historians uh, to chime in and offer historical perspectives on to the news today. And I posed, metaphors make sense of the past, but can they guide us towards a post-corona virus future? As I think about issues of temporality at this very moment, I keep coming back to zombies and ghosts because they provide us with lessons of the past in our present. Zombies, the very walking dead, are a thing of the past. They were once alive and now they are not but they remain present in that they are dead walking among us. But so too are ghosts. They are figures of the past that are made legible and appear to us in our present with the prospect of their presence, uh, you know, the, the, the prospect of their presence in our future. 
In this way, zombies and ghosts are temporal figures of life and death that present us as thinkers um, and people trying to make the best sense of the world around us with manifestations that blur the past, the present, and the future, I think in important and provocative ways. Like so many others, I've been ever more grateful for art in my life these days. Um, I've literally purchased new artwork <laughs> in these days uh, without realizing, I swear this is true, um, both pieces that I bought in the past few, uh, few days were about zombies and horror. Uh, they were vintage horror film posters, one from Mexico from the 1950s and another from the 1970s in the United States, both low budget films that I hadn't seen or heard of before. Um, I didn't realize how much these themes have consumed me these days until I sat down to write my comments for today. Uh, but back to the arts, I know so many of us have come to see how we appreciate and need art and artists, not just through tough times, but always. If you've seen more Netflix and Hulu shows than you've ever thought you would consume, or read more books or feature pieces, or listened or waited for more music by artists, or been disappointed by their cancellations or postponed statuses, you too know the importance of it all. For those who want to cut the humanities and arts, we have to remind ourselves constantly just how necessary they are for our well-being and how much we rely on the important cultural and political work that they do for us. So, a little shame to admit, but not fully, that I was catching up on AMC show, this AMC show on zombies called The Walking Dead um, and thought a lot about the idea of apocalypse. Um, how often I was seeing this metaphor emerge about how this moment in time, coronavirus, felt like the apocalypse. And I thought, this metaphor just doesn't work. Um, the idea that the world has fallen apart can only be productive, I think, if we were to believe that the dystopian uh, future that doesn't already, ex uh, doesn't already exist for so many. As my fellow panelist and friend Whitney Bauman once suggested to me in a meeting, for indigenous people and cultures, uh, for example, apocalypse is in many ways not a fear to come, but a past and a present. For those experiencing the first major brunts of climate crisis too, apocalypse is not just now, it's ongoing. It's only made more visible by coronavirus. For those who anticipate and fear early death, including men like George Floyd, the narrative of being the walking dead carries a very different weight that challenges our sense of time in important ways. And I also want to interject here briefly to say that the zombie, the zombie, uh, historically, was a powerful symbol where it was first imagined. And that was in what later became Haiti, under the massively violent institution of slavery there that made the then French colony of Saint-Domingue, which later, of course, became Haiti, that is the Black Republic. The very narrative of a zombie, or a person who is so numbed by the violence of their life, that only in imagining a form of a deadly state of life could they survive. The zombie was a tool and a metaphor of resistance among the enslaved and their ancestors, those who liberated themselves from slavery and created a new nation, that of Haiti. So before Hollywood imagined a flesh-eating zombie, an entity of total horror and the unimaginable, the zombie was an inspiration, a catalyst for change and resistance. What I want to suggest is that metaphors like that of the zombie can be found in fiction and artistic work and that they really matter in moments of times of crisis. They can inspire change, encourage persistence, or perpetuate injustice. While fictional stories shine a mirror on our present, enduring these interconnected crises requires something different to identify inequality, change course, and create different futures. Like a pandemic, many of these works of fiction I'm alluding to tell stories through the metaphor of a contagion or a threat that needs to be contained. And these stories can shape our understanding of the sick as either deserving or undeserving. This happened a lot with HIV AIDS beginning in the 1980s, for example, when metaphors of patient zeros, promiscuous bug chasers, and satanic cultists were commonplace. I think of Stephen King's 1986 novel, It, which is best associated with the villainous clown Pennywise. But that story extracted the very real life fears of surviving or you know, of coming of age in the midst of a plague that were being felt due to HIV AIDS. So too did Anne Rice's Vampire Saga. I think about Interview with the Vampire, for instance, in which the monsters required life-giving blood that along with other bodily fluids posed real risk of infection. Artists have played uh, playfully pondered concepts of time and futurity, 
in their employment of metaphors on AIDS and sickness, on silence and liberation. Filmmaker Marlon Riggs, his 1989 Tongues Untied, celebrated black men loving each other in a time of constant death. The metaphor of unmuting silences that had generated death was a powerful one amidst, amid uh, HIV AIDS, especially among people of color. I think here, of course, of ACT UP, silence equals death. And now with the death of Larry Kramer, this is, you know, kind of carries even heavier weight. In the early 1990s, uh, Felix Gonzalez Torres created art that resonated with those living with or anticipating AIDS. He presented clocks in place of lovers whose lives slowly ticked away. And when TLC uh, recorded their 1994 mega hit Waterfalls, the rap trio described the resource poor urban landscape in which necessity nudged people to chase unruly waterfalls in lieu of the much more manageable rivers and lakes. In navigating that uncertain terrain, one man's quote, health was fading and he doesn't know why. But a little bit on ghosts too, which have been haunting much of my thinking about this. I have largely returned to historian and public intellectual Taya Miles for inspiration. She has this provocative take on public history and the memory of slavery. She explored some of the so-called haunted houses, really these old slaveholding plantations in the US South that offered and continue to offer haunted tours. And she found out that many of the stories there that are told about ghosts that were long believed to haunt these grounds were entirely fictionalized and sought really to whitewash the real anti-Black terror and violence of the institution of slavery. That is, these stories made white supremacy and anti-Black violence more palatable to mostly white tourists who would be less uncomfortable dealing with that violent history through stories of largely innocuous ghosts. But the real ghosts are with us today, and they live on in the form of state and anti-Black violence, visible both in the case of George Floyd and so many other people like him, and the often faceless and nameless fallen of survivors of coronavirus. If history teaches us that metaphors are tools that can help us restructure life and build alternate futures, I think we're due for some new metaphors, and no doubt, massive calls to action that offer us all a path to liberation and survival as we come to realize that so many among us are indeed living a life of social death, not unlike the walking dead. Thank you so much for your beautiful words and your contribution. Um, I think we'll just move along and then have the discussion at the end. Next, we have um, Ana Menendez and your thoughts on temporalities in this moment. Uh, Edward Said wrote something that uh, I've never forgotten, and I, I'll quote, to think of exile as beneficially humanistic is to banalize its mutilations. And I've been thinking of that quote uh, a lot uh, recently in the context of this pandemic and the multitude of opinion pieces and reflections that uh, it has inspired. And we certainly don't want to belittle the mutilations of this virus, uh, 100,000 dead, uh, and the inequities of suffering uh, and inequalities um, that it has exposed and which um, Julio captured so beautifully in, in his, uh, what he just uh, spoke about. Uh, and that doesn't mean, and I don't think Saeed would have wanted us to interpret it as uh, a prescription against imagination because tragedy, be it exile or pandemic or war, so engulfs the present that often the only relief comes through acts of imagination. And it is those temporal leaps, either backwards into nostalgia or forward into daydreams, uh, that we recreate the world, that new possibilities emerge. And Said in that same essay notes that, quote, exile creates a new world to rule. Uh, at the beginning of the lockdown, my nine-year-old son and I spontaneously invented a game we call Future, where we pretend to be 40 years into the future and he's the father and I'm the nine-year-old child and he recalls to me what it was like to be a child during the great coronavirus pandemic of 2020 and I've learned a lot as a result of this game uh, I learned that he used to worry about his elderly grandparents um, and he also added slyly his elderly parents because uh, he's a big jokester um, one recent evening, he started recalling that as a child, he was very scared of the armed protesters. Uh, 
Um, so I, as his child, asked him if there was anything he wanted to protest. So much of this game for me is really about giving him agency. Um, and he said that when it was safe, he actually did go out and protest. And one of the things he protested for was higher teacher pay. And he tells me, the son, um, the world today owes a lot to those protests. And now that's why teachers are the highly, most highly paid professions. Um, he added, which I thought was incredibly prescient uh, of him, uh, that COVID was a border and that many things improved after that. And he made a long list, which I won't go into because uh, we don't have time. And, and my son is way more interesting to me than he is to everybody else. Um, but my or original game, the aim in this game was to encourage him to imagine the future because he's the one who will build it, he and his contemporaries. And you can't build something without first calling it forth in your mind. The future emerges out of our present desires and those need to be articulated. I say that as a kind of defense uh, as well of exercises such as the one we're currently engaged in in this panel uh, in talking about time, about metaphor, as a way of groping towards the future. Uh, we can only create that future by debating and talking and imagining endlessly uh, as we are now and as countless have been doing since this crisis began. It is through this kind of imaginative discourse, this kind of give and take that we make worlds. Um, Mark Lilla, professor of humanities at Columbia, had this great line in a New York Times op-ed uh, this last Sunday, uh, and I'll quote from that as well. Human beings want to feel that they are on a power walk to the future, when in fact we are always tapping our canes on the pavement in the fog. I really love that quote, and I loved his uh, op-ed. Uh, he, he wrote this as by way of cautioning humility when it came to predicting in the future. But I have a small quibble with that uh, op-ed only because I think uh, there's a difference between the kind of hubristic um, forecasting that we see from politicians and the kind of imaginative conjuring uh, that artists and thinkers engage in. Um, stories don't try to predict the future. They are the music of that tapping on the pavement. Uh, a few weeks ago, I'm not even certain what month it was, uh, I don't know what year we're in anymore, uh, but I wrote this very quick kind of emotional op-ed for the Sun Sentinel uh, where I evoke this kind of creative power uh, that the imagination has. And uh, I asked at the end of it, what if we harnessed uh, our wondrous uh, human imagination uh, into rebuilding a culture of, of creative commonality that rewarded the con uh, conservation of resources and, and a dignified way of life? And what if we could fashion from this terrible moment a world that promised all of us lasting shelter? And I think this is the beauty of, of exercises such as this. And so I, I'm, I'm doubly uh, thankful to all of you and, and to the university that has made this conversation possible. And I'm looking forward to continuing. Thank you so much for your words, um, beautiful words. And now we will move on to our final panelist, Whitney Bowman. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm also excited to be here with all of you. And thanks to all the sponsors and for or the organization and the, all the tech support. Um, it's great to be here. So, um, and here for me is actually in Berlin. So we, we, this is one of the things that's possible with the, these sorts of technologies that are really cool. Um, okay, so um, I really appreciate uh, the comments that came before me. And I, I think that we will have a lot to talk about um, in terms of what I'm gonna say. So some of it's a repeat of what you already heard and others are sort of maybe a little bit of a different take. So um, in a recent book um, that I wrote with Kevin O'Brien called Environmental Ethics and Uncertainty Wrestling with Wicked Problems, we dealt with a bit, we dealt a lot with the concept of time. We argued there, and I argue here still, that the chronological, anthropocentric, or human-centered time that has been imposed over the face of the planet is one of the sources for social and ecological ills around the planet today. This fossil-fueled time, as we called it, has literally been constructed over the past century as the mining and use of fossil fuels have sped up the process of transportation, communication, and production since the time of the Green Revolution after World War II. 
a period some sociologists refer to as the Great Acceleration, which has now led to the geological time known as the Anthropocene. So such acceleration has created what some in the energy humanities refer to as petrocultures. We, all of us moderns at least, are born into and anointed by oil. Our deepest desires, hopes, and dreams are shaped by this sped up understanding of what is possible within one human lifetime and, and what people born two centuries ago and even in some places today could never imagine. This fossil fuel time is accompanied by a shrinking of causality to efficient causality and a reductive and productive model of science. In other words, we look for how technologies of all kinds can benefit human beings, at least some human beings, in the most efficient and economically productive way. We are literally recreating the planet in the image of a fossil-fueled humanity. From this perspective, because ambiguity and complexity are too time-consuming and cannot be tolerated, we project certainty where none exists through externalizing social and ecological costs. The only other option than certainty from this fossil fuel perspective is confusion, which is part of the reason we have a whole host of people latching onto fake news, alternative facts, and conspiracy theories. Rather than dealing with the ambiguity and uncertainty in this situation of fossil fuel time of humanity where every second counts, we comfort ourselves with false certainties. Accumulatively, this fossil fuel time, the fossil fuel humanity, and the remaking of the planet from within this version of sped up time is outstripping the carrying capacity of the planet. Human bodies, animal bodies, plant bodies, mineral bodies, ecosystems, bioregions, and even the climate itself is buckling under the pressure of fossil fuel time. For short, we referred to this fossil fuel time over the past century as progress. Progress in science, technology, medicine, agriculture, etc. Well, if mass economic injustice, systemic sexism and racism, and mass ecological degradation of the planet is called progress, then I want to fail at this whole project and start thinking differently about how we might live within the planetary community rather than recreate it in the image of fossil fueled humanity. Perhaps we can begin to see a different understanding of time from within the slowdown many of us, though not all of us, have experienced during this pandemic. What, what my colleague and I called planetary times are the time and pace of ambiguity. As philosopher of science Isabel Stangers argues, perhaps instead of the goal-oriented thinking of progress and all the tragedies that pile up along with it, we ought to think about time and our place in the planet as a polyver, a meandering, a wandering about with no specific goal, but to go on a walk, what here in Germany they call Spaziergang or a stroll. This sense of time is not about rebuilding the world in terms of progress for some humans, which again, involves reducing the complexity of the world towards certain human ends, but rather it's about noticing the multiple times of the planet, the times of rivers, of making sourdough bread, which I've been doing a lot of, of birds or plant growth, or a river or a mountain. This is the time of creativity and mourning, neither of which can be forced into efficient causality or chronological time. In my own academic discipline of religious studies, this understanding of time is found in meditation, in yoga, in those moments of aha or connectivity that some Christians refer to as kairos moments. This is the time of spiritual wandering that Aboriginal Australians speak of, or the shamanic time of inhabiting other life forms and dead ancestors often brought about with the help of mind altering substances. These different times help us to recognize the ambiguity of language and concepts, the porous nature of bodies and the interconnectedness of the bodies that make up the planetary system. This is the time that enables us to see multiple perspectives, inhabit multiple understandings of time, and gives us a more informed sense of the complexity and uncertainty of the worlds we inhabit, which make up this planetary community. Perhaps, just perhaps, if we can begin to rethink our desires, hopes, and dreams, away from fossil fuel time that takes humans out of this world and we ground them in, the, in these ambiguous multiple planetary times, we can begin to think about and co-construct post-pandemic worlds that are more about the flourishing and resilience of the entire planetary community and not just fossil fueled humans. Thanks. Thank you so much, Whitney, for your beautiful words as well. 
Um, this has been such a delight to hear each of you uh, and your thoughts on notions of temporality in this moment um, and the use of humanities. As I'm listening, I have just a couple of thoughts that I'm going to throw out and then I hope that you'll ask one another questions um, and we can have a little bit of a conversation. So, I mean, one of the, one of the contradictions of this moment that we're all living in, or, you know, there are many, many contradictions. So on the one hand, Whitney lays out a, a sense that I'm, I'm going to simplify a very complex word, so I'm sorry ahead of time, but this is off the cuff, um, that you lay out a way in which the kind of slowing down of time or the not modern time or that you called it something beautiful what was your word time um essentially allows for and anna said this too a degree of kind of creativity and a kind of pushing it back against the kind of ticking of the clock and all of this so that in a way you're presenting it or a couple of you or all of you are presenting it potentially as a moment of possibility and creativity that's what i want to say so we're living in a moment of, of creativity and possibility because of the way in which time is slowed down, is challenged, modern time is transformed, and so forth, necessarily. On the other hand, and here's the kind of contradictory piece, we have a lot of the ex examples that Julio began with, and we think about the way in which this moment, in fact, simply exaggerates the inequalities that have existed for so very long, right? So, uh, so, so in order to enjoy making your sourdough bread, you have to be able to have the things necessary to have it. You know, I'm not saying anything none of us don't know, but there is a kind of deep set of contradictions built into this moment that I think do weigh on these questions of time and future and how to build that world that we ended with in Whitney's words um, that I think we still need to do a lot of thinking through so that, so that we don't end up being nostalgic about this moment, simply right to use Anna's notion I mean ultimately we, we can't be nostalgic about this moment once it's gone because it is so fraught it does so bring to the surface all of the the you know racial gender etc um, inequities that exist in our society so it's not really a question it's more of a statement but I, I guess I'm mostly curious to hear each of you react to one another to some degree because I think that your words fit together very nicely but also do kind of um, create a little bit of tension, which might be a productive way to have a conversation. So you can react to what I said or open it up to you. You want to start, Whitney? I'm looking at your face now. Okay. <laughs> I can't who you're looking at. Um, no, thank you. I think, I think it's absolutely right. And I, I also, um, I, I read this piece the other day on uh, sort of the way in which people of color grieve climate change much more deeply than white people. And this has to do with the history of racism and the effects of climate change on communities of color. And, and, and one of the things that really stuck out with it was that in that article was that hope is such a white thing. It's like, it's a, you know, everybody wants to always go to this hopeful future sort of thing. And it's, and that to me is sort of what the reason I like to think, uh, with Donna Haraway a little bit about alternative futures that stay with the trouble. So her book about staying with the trouble and, 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 and creating together, weaving these stories out of the, the, the complexities and the racisms and the sexisms that exist, rather than just sort of like projecting a hopeful future in which everybody gets there. It's about this code, this process of, 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 of narrating together um, um, uh, these, these types of stories so that once again, these, um, these isms are not covered over by what it, what did you say the problem of nostalgia or daydreaming right. <laughs> that, that that was brought up or or sort of you know the the, the thing of, of 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 recreating the past through these haunted houses so that we don't have to deal with slavery and, and and these sorts of things no we need to deal with those we need these memorials and these and this and this moment of mourning and grieving and 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 also atonement even um, and and this sort of I don't know complex understanding of time might have more spaces for us to do that. Yeah, no, I agree, absolutely. We'll go backwards, how about you, Anna? <laughs> uh, I, I agree, and I, I, I so love this concept of planetary time uh, that Whitney uh, brought up, because it, it has given a, a pause to our lives, to all of us, and, and um, some of us have been much more privileged in, in that pause, right? Some of, we've had, we've had homes in which to retreat, we've had jobs that we could do remotely. Um, and, and that 
has forced us into an, another, a deeper level of contemplation about the sort of society that we have built kind of in a dream. Uh, this is one of the things that I uh, approached in my op-ed, which is, you know, we're like in this dream of, uh, you know, fossil fuel dream in, in Whitney's words, where we, it's just more and more and more. And I, I make the point that at one point here we were in our house and, and my husband said to me, you know, if the food distribution system collapses, we're all going to starve. And how did this happen? when you know our peasant ancestors had all the food that they needed and they you know had their chickens and their vegetables and so forth and and i said yeah you know i, I here i am i have a, a closet full of shoes and a 401k made of smoke and and that's what we're going forth into the future with and and this is from a very privileged uh position of course and so how do we together without um without you know distorting or mutilating the moment, uh, to use Saeed's word, how do we take what we have learned in this pause, uh, which is very meditative, and, and how do we take that forward in a way that honors the mutilations of the present and the past, which have brought us here, because we are, the, this, you know, upside down world in which we live in is a product of individual and collective decisions that we made over many, many generations. And one of the things that we need to be thinking about is what are the even small decisions that we make going forward that will snowball into these uh, major problems down the line. You know, you look at these old photos of the Industrial Revolution, and as Whitney said, it's progress. See, London fog, that was progress. And, you know, the machine age and just moving forward. And we look back on that and said, that's, that's where the seed of destruction uh, was planted the seed of slavery of 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 everything that has led us to all that's wrong with this moment. It began with this sense of progress. And so, how do we uh, make sure that going forward we are uh, very conscious of the seeds that we are planting that seem innocuous uh, and small uh, right now? If I may, and we'll turn to to Julio. Um, yes, but it also is the of course progress. It's not all bad, right? So, so I think we have to kind of think very com complexly about that. Like, women get the right to vote. We have mass political participation. There's all kinds of things that happen that ultimately <clears throat> are a result of the, the very same set of processes. So it's complex, right? Um, and 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 if we imagine this moment as a pause, at, it strikes me then this leads very perfectly into Julio's comments. I think the first thing that we need to do, right, is maybe slay the zombies, <laughs> right? Or, right? We need to figure out and confront and slay those kind of shadows of the past as we move on to build a future that looks very different, that's more reflective of what, what Whitney was suggesting. So Julio, I turn to you. I, I think that's right. I mean, that is the, the, by the way, thank you for, thank you to all of you. I got so much out of this and I'm, now my brain is moving in a hundred different, I think, <laughs> directions. But I, I, I think if, yeah, if I find this kind of concept of pausing, you know, uh, to be a, almost, this is, <laughs> now my head is turning to this moment where I'm seeing like a VCR paused and like, but it's a VCR that's being paused with like a lot of static or something right so like that static somehow represents these kind of lapses wrinkles in time uh you know whatever that might be but i think you know what i've gathered one of the things that i've gathered from from all of these comments thus far is is that inherent contradiction and i think the the that tension is is generative so that we if we we're to think i really find anna's concept of nostalgia to be really generative here because because nostalgia could be both violent and and uh, traumatic and and also really you know positive and in, you know if, to embrace the the difficult with the with the beauty so that you know progress for whom and 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 for for what purpose um, I find that to be I find that to be generative and I I think that if we were to imagine uh, what this means looking forward that what it would take right is for an embrace. Uh, of that haunted house, right? That is to uh, embrace and to a, a very clear, uh, uh, you know, acknowledgement of of that of the horrors of the past, um, to allow us to move forward. That that's the way to a better future. It would take a reckoning. 
no way. Right? That's a correct one. Um, let me think if we want to do one more round or if you have any questions that you directly want to ask one another. I think this could be an opportunity for that. Um, otherwise, I could ask a general question and have you respond. But I want to open it up to, the, to all of you people to, to see if you want to ask one another a question. I just have a very a quick question. Uh, Whitney, yeah. if you could give, give us the name of the book again <laughs> um, that, that you wrote. Um, Oh, sure. Sorry. Yeah. Um, it's called Environmental Ethics and Uncertainty, Wrestling with Wicked Problems. It's a great title. Thanks. I also, Rebecca, I, I think that in, in terms of slaying zombies, I know a, a really giant zombie who, who only tweets at the whim of whatever is best politically and economically for him and is moved by these external forces and has seems to have no center at all. So yeah. we could start there in November. We could. And actually, that though I agree completely. And the question I was going to ask was a relatively pragmatic one about thinking about the future and slaying zombies and all of it. What are you know, since hopefully some people will be listening to this, what do we imagine, not so much what the future will be, but what it is we can do. So to turn these kind of ideas into notions of social action, um, uh, you know, kind of move between the idea, the realms of the ideas and action in order to, in fact, craft the better world and slay, slay, the, slay the zombies. Thoughts on that? Besides the one you've already mentioned, which is to vote in November, for sure. Well, you know, it's such a cliche to, to say, oh, this was a failure of imagination, right? Uh, but, but I, you know, this whole moment that we're in was a huge failure of imagination um, for people who thought that, you know, this presidency was going to be fine and, you know, uh, it doesn't matter that you're not experienced, it's, you know, things will work out. I mean, as early as February, he was saying everything's going to work out just well, you know, just great. Um, and so I, I again, and I'm, I'm a storyteller, so I'm constantly appealing to the imagination, but you know, the imagination is not just daydreaming and wishing for the best. I mean, we also need to have an imagination for apocalypse. We have to have an imagination for the way that our choices, i.e. how we vote, um, have really potentially devastating consequences, uh, not just for ourselves, but for uh, the most vulnerable, for the environment. And if we can just keep that on the at, at the forefront of our thinking that you know maybe you have been fine during this time, um, you know, stretch your imagination uh, to what will happen of four more years of this and four more years of the brutalizing of the marginalized and of 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 this of the uh, sort of sowing of divisions. You know, take that to its conclusion and where are we going to end up? And that's you know important to think about. Pretty dystopian future. I I really, I'm sorry. I really appreciate uh, these things here too because I I have to when I was listening to Whitney and, and Anna's uh, comments too. I, I kept on going back to Michelle Rothrio silencing the past um, as this idea of the the Haitian Revolution, you know, in Saint Domingue as unthinkable. That is to so many people a narrative of that which could, you know, that the enslaved, uh, that these black women and men could uh, somehow become their own leaders and liberate themselves was, you know, it took decades and centuries uh, and Haiti's still feeling it today, right? For, for not just uh, for the changes to immediately uh, to come forth, but for people to, to acknowledge that that had happened. Um, it was in fact uh, an unthinkable enterprise, an unthinkable exercise in, um, in, 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 you know, liberation. And uh, it's not to say that to, to, there's, we could see, we could learn so much from the past and to understand how, uh, how certain narratives are dismissed and, and rendered uh, entirely, un, you know, unreadable, legible uh, to a particularly white imagination. Um, and I think that, 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 you know, this has been really productive to think about those concepts. I Thank so you. Well. Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. I was, gonna, I was just gonna say no. I think so as well. And I mean, I, I was just thinking about, um, you know, I'm not gonna remember where I read that, but I was thinking about how the the, the sort of the transformations of the of the 60s, the the you know, and the 50s and 60s, the the um, 
um, uh, civil rights movements and, and women's movements and the feminist movement and the queer movement and, and all these sorts of movements happen and at, at after World War II and there's a GI Bill and people have relatively um, inexpensive education and that people have relatively in expensive healthcare, right? So you don't have to, the minute that you get out of school, rush to get a, an education, then rush to get a job, and then so you can pay off your loans and pay for your medical bills, right? So there's there's that sense of hurriedness, right, that, that comes along with that, that it doesn't give you time to sit around and think about these critical issues. And what came out of those critical moments to the university, critical race mm -hmm. theories, queer theories, feminist theories, and these are the things that are now being shunned by a certain uh, so a certain piece of the population and says, oh, education's elitist. Um, it, I mean, it sounds to me like, no, we just don't want to listen to those voices. That's not what an education's for. Um, I, I lost where I was going there, but, but my point is that, you know, this is, a, this is one of those slowdowns, although it, we'll see what kind of um, economic stimulus comes out of it. Um, but maybe, maybe at least in small ways, it could provide, again, that, that space for critically critically analyzing the the narratives that, that you know our, our our students and 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 we have been fed in ways that might be productive for whatever comes next I don't know I agree and I think maybe it's it's the humanities to turn it back to that I think it's the humanities that can kind of lay bare and make naked the fact that these unthinkable narratives are in fact incredibly thinkable right and so in some ways it's our jobs to make that visible and to think about to take it back to time to think about how those narratives that are crafted and made real in the past in fact continue to haunt us today and into the future and so as you were suggesting it's our job to expose all of that Right? That is what we do. We must expose that. And that's why you write your op-eds and, you know, we interact with our students in order to kind of expose those narratives of the past in order to, you know, to end on an optimistic note, hopefully together craft a slightly better future. So thank you all panelists very much for being here this morning and for sharing in what was such an incredibly productive and inspiring conversation. And thank you too to the Dorothea Green lecture series and to SIPA and everyone else. Take care. Thank you.